Hello and welcome to this Manufacturing Process Technology Part 2, Module 27. In the last uh, module, we had mainly looked into the system processes related to electrochemical machining, uh, particularly discussing electrochemical uh, grinding, electro stream drilling and uh, also uh, just electrochemical drilling or EC, ECD, ECG and ESD. So, uh, we kind of left uh, uh, the discussion uh, with the note that we will be looking at some of the system processes for the mechanical material removal. You have already done two uh, different processes with detailed modeling aspects including AJM, abrasive jet machining as well as the uh, USM or ultrasonic machining. So, there are many other processes which are particularly important when it comes to finish machining or surface finish. So, uh, and these processes are in, in, in general known as abrasive finishing processes. These are all system processes of the mechanical way of, uh, you know, mechanical non-traditional way of removing material. Obviously, uh, the need for high accuracy and high efficiency uh, machining of uh, difficult to machine materials is making need for these uh, abrasive uh, finishing processes stronger and stronger. For example, uh, if you wanted to finish uh, a piece of silicon to the level of less than a micron uh, surface finish, it is very, very important that we deploy some processes apart from the routine CMP or chemical mechanical polishing, we should be able to do with a high yield, you know, the surface finish processes. So, the cost of surface finish processes for a roughness value in the sub micron range has increased quite sharply and uh, therefore, it you know all the more needs these AFPs or the abrasive finishing processes and that is one of the reasons why they are in existence. So, the basic principle is really the use of a large number of random cutting edges with indefinite orientation and geometry for effective removal of the material and similar to any other uh, abrasive based finishing process uh, the grains are all randomly oriented they have sharp edges and uh, they have um, they can be spanned over all different kind of geometries and because of the extremely uh, thin chips which are produced in the abrasive machining it allows better surface finish closer tolerances so on and so forth so the first process of the afps is actually abrasive flow finishing and uh, basically uh, the working principle of uh, such a process look at for example lapping or honing processes which are again abrasive based uh, they have a similar uh, indefinite orientation of the grains or you know uh, you basically in one case uh, you have uh, the possibility of a slurry of a grains of abrasives which is normally used in polishing operation where the, uh, the slurry can be able to get into any of the crevices and small gaps thus even being able to uh, finish machine in uh, rather inaccessible areas in complex geometries. So, uh, also because of the extremely uh, thin chips which are produced in abrasive machining processes, it allows better surface finish um, and uh, that is why the, the question of sub micron uh, really. So, uh, let us look at or compare some of these uh, processes on, on um, you know uh, sort of a same scale in terms of surface finish etcetera and what are the capabilities. So, let us look at four processes in general, two of them are the modern or non-conventional, non-traditional non uh, abrasive flow processes like uh, magnetic abrasive uh, finishing or abrasive flow machining. And uh, let us uh, compare them with two conventionally available lapping and honing processes which are otherwise available as a variant of grinding. So, if we look at the surface finish range uh, of the average process uh, feature size left over after the finish machining has been carried out in case of lapping, this varies between uh, 0 0.025 to 0 0.1 micron. So, that is about 100 nanometers finish. Okay. So, in honing as well, it varies again uh, between 0 0.025 and 0 0.5 micron or 500 nanometers finish. And uh, if you have, you know, uh, uh, the scope of getting into abrasive flow techniques. So, this magnetic abrasive finishing is basically uh, uh, <coughs> something where a, a finish which is not as good as lapping maybe, but at least uh, 10 orders more uh, or 10 orders less finishing of up to a micron range and probably delving down into the sub micron range all the all the way up to about 40 nanometers finish is possible using MAF techniques. And similarly, abrasive flow machining can go all the way from 0 0.05 to about 1.0 uh, 
uh, microns. So basically, it is about 1000 nanometers all the way to about 50 nanometers finish. So the domain of these two new non-traditional processes as you can see is quite large. Similarly, if we look at dimension tolerances, uh, the uh, MAF processes kind of ram into them with lapping and honing both, whereas AFM may have a slightly higher dimension tolerance. Material removal uh, in these processes uh, in comparison to let us say lapping or uh, even honing are quite comparable uh, and in fact, in, in uh, case of let us say MAF, if we compare MAF, MAF directly to the lapping process, in fact, this is better. You know, so, you have a higher yield possibility because of the higher amount of material removal rate uh, in the MAF processes or AFM processes compared to the conventional lapping and honing. Similarly, uh, if we look at the pressures which are deployed uh, onto the, the surface because of the operation, uh, we can see that in this case, you know, uh, if we compare Newton per square millimeter or 10 to the power of 6 Newton per square meter or Pascals. Okay. So, the uh, conventional processes like lapping and honing again are able to uh, work in the range of megapascals, whereas uh, a technique like MAF could actually go ahead with uh, almost a KPA level pressure, which is lesser to the workpiece in comparison to a uh, lapping or honing process. You may, you may have to understand because it is a finished machining process, typically the requirement may be on a surface which may not be that big for example, or, or that, that high strength. For example, in silicon wafers, when we need the polishing of a surface of silicon wafers, uh, generally the, the wafers are of all sort of thickness ranging from 300 microns all the way to 900 microns. Okay. So, uh, in for the wafer to handle a pressure in the range of megapascals, it sometimes becomes a problem and therefore lapping warning may not work or may, it may shatter the, the wafer base, okay. whereas uh, if, if not properly executed. But uh, in case of MAF and AFM, you may find out that uh, the processes are comparatively better. AFM of course has a higher amount of pressure in the megapascals range, but at least the magnetic abrasive uh, finishing methods could be deployed there where the substrate sizes are uh, increasingly small or they, ha they lack strength. So, <laughs> abrasive product types, uh, normally in the lapping process you have abrasive grains entrained in a liquid vehicle. So, the, the region which is needed to be lapped is basically sprayed with this abrasive slurry and then there is a, um, a tool which comes and rubs the slurry against the uh, the surface. For example, in honing again you have bonded abrasives to a stick, honing stick where you have abrasives uh, coated on all side of the particular stick. In uh, MAF processes you have magnetic abrasive composed of ferromagnetic particles and conventional abrasive grids and the idea is that in a magnetic field all the ferromagnetic uh, particles would align and trap within them or trap within their crevices the abrasive particles so that it is like a brush or it is a virtual brush which has been formulated where the uh, you know, uh, th there is a possibility of having uh, the, the abrasive pressed because of this alignment of the otherwise ferromagnetic particles uh, and squeezing the abrasive particles against the surface where you are wanting to carry out the finish. Similarly, in the AFM process, you have a, a sort of a uh, semi-solid abrasive medium, um, something like, you know, uh, maybe a, something like a putti where uh, you have uh, you know or, or maybe DAO, you know where you have the abrasives bonded within the medium and you basically move this highly semi-solid uh, viscoelastic carrier medium with the abrasives uh, using higher pressure and typically for internal surface finish etc of pipeline etc this is the best process that you could actually use uh, two pressure cylinders on either side and move this uh, highly viscous material, thick material with the abrasive in the internal uh, portion of the pipeline that has to be machined. Okay. So, that is how you have uh, a process comparison, feature comparison for uh, whatever the abrasive products are being used. Similarly, um, if we look at work surface configuration in terms of accessibility of the workpiece, etc., typically lapping and uh, honing processes may find out <laughs> applications in flat cylindrical and spherical surfaces. Honing you can have probably only cylindrical surfaces. MAF, Again, flattened cylindrical surfaces, MAF can actually be, uh, if we can do the 
tool path planning in a right manner, it could be over any kind of complex contour or surfaces. In fact, groups working within our nation has shown MAF to be carried out within complex knee joints or hip joints earlier. The AFM process again is uh, related mostly to inaccessible areas and complex internal passages. For example, if you wanted to find uh, or do machining on the internal contour of a, uh, of a pipeline, this is the best process to uh, take it ahead. The abrasive flow machining is the best process to take it ahead. So, let us now look into the different finishing processes, particularly the abrasive flow finishing or AFF process. So, in an abrasive flow machining or uh, flow finishing, it is a kind of finishing process in which a small amount of material is removed by flowing a semi solid abrasive laden putti over the surface to be finished. So, this is how it looks like actually. Okay. So, it is a ball made out of this putti or vis highly, uh, highly, highly elastic, viscoelastic kind of material where abrasive grains are all trapped within this particular uh, medium. The only thing is that this medium can be under pressure. Uh, expanded and contracted and can change shape and basically the idea is to be able to deploy this medium within contours where you want to do finish machining particularly on the internal surfaces of those contours. The media has <coughs> such high viscosity that it can be held between fingers, it is like a rubber ball which can be deformed by applying a little pressure and now you can see here for example how the machining has been carried out. There are two vertically opposed cylinders which extrude the abrasive medium back and forth. So, there is one cylinder and a plunger on the upper side here and similarly one on the down uh, bottom here and this is really the medium which we just were talking about. So, medium of viscoelastic solid uh, entrapping abrasive grains. And uh, there is a motion of all these abrasive grains uh, where you know the finish uh, finishing can take place really on the internal contour of this particular element which is kept as a uh, sandwich in a sandwich orientation between both the cylinders vertically opposed cylinders. So, this process is good for operations like deburring, radiusing, polishing, removing recast layers, producing compressive residual stresses etcetera. The processes again can be employed to machine. Uh, probably tens of parts at the same time because all you need to do is to have proper cylinder actuated mechanism which is sandwiching all these parts together under a similar kind of a you know environment. And so therefore, it is a highly productive and high yield process you can do many finishing operations together. The semi uh, solid abrasive media is forced through the workpiece or through the restrictive passage formed by the workpiece and the tooling together. This here is the restrictive passage that uh, talking about restrictive passage. force typically may be uh, hydraulically applied uh, particularly on both these uh, cylinders or mechanically applied through motors and you know uh, crank crank wheel kind of arrangements. And uh, the velocity of uh, the media obviously uh, would also depend on the cross sectional area through which the uh, you know media is transported particularly the passageway cross sectional areas. And uh, if you can reduce the area from the main cylinder portion to the uh, workpiece portion, you always have a uh, better uh, flow resistance offered and more is the resistance, more is the, uh, the energy that is needed which can be distributed again uh, uniformly across the medium and uh, that gives you larger forces uh, which are needed to plow the material. So, abrasive particles really uh, act here as a cutting tool uh, where uh, the abrasive particles are pulled uh, or pushed against the internal contour at a certain normal force and uh, uh, are, are again made to move uh, vertical or parallel to the axis of the component. So, that there are scratches and uh, you know of, of very small dimensions and eventually uh, this may lead to finishing. Whatever uh, debris is being generated in from the internal contour is again carried out by the viscoelastic medium as such because it is a sticky medium and uh, you know once you have flown this medium through you can probably uh, if it is not magnetic uh, medium you could remove the particles through magnetic or other means and then redeploy them back into the machine. So, abrasive particles act as cutting tools hence it is a multi point cutting process and it gives uh, reasonably low MRR which is again another requirement for finish machining operations. So, a typical abrasive flow machining system is shown right here. The machine uh, has two cylinders 
again an abrasive media which controls the extrusion pressure and flow volume. Media is extruded back and forth from one cylinder to another and with the help of a hydraulic clamp as you can see here uh, and uh, this leads to the, uh, the flow of the medium uh, in this particular region here shown by the uh, hatched section okay, which goes into the internal contour where it has to finish machine. So, there is a reduction in area and an increase in the overall force of resistance and uh, uh, these are really the walls which get finished because of the to and from motion of the medium because of the motion initiated by the two hydraulic rams on both sides. So, <laughs> that is how the flow finishing machine takes place. Uh, today we would also try to look at another very uh, important process which is actually related to thermal machining. Uh, in fact, uh, we have been looking at mechanical uh, machining and it is uh, associated or sister processes. We have also looked at the electrochemical machining and its sister processes. Now, we want to find out how material uh, can be found uh, or removed in a thermal manner. So, there are various uh, uh, modalities which are associated with again non-traditional processes where thermal <coughs> removal is deployed. One of them is discharges particularly DM or electro discharge machining, another is through electron beams where the electron beam can expose uh, a surface and try to create you know uh, uh, momentum transfer onto the lattice atoms which relates to an increase in the kinetic energy, overall kinetic energy and then again material removal or a laser beam where there is a photon to phonon conversion. Uh, because of bond vibrations and uh, also uh, the absorption of, of the material due to which there is a machining operation which uh, is carried out. Uh, there can be many other means of uh, creating uh, high temperature processes or high temperature zones on the workpiece. one is using of plasma beams, another is ion beams. So, these can also be visualized as uh, one of the many processes where thermal machining can be achieved on work pieces. So, the basic principle behind thermal machining is basically removal of the uh, machining allowance by melting or vaporizing the workpiece. Okay. So, you have to really increase the surface kinetic energy to an extent that the material starts melting. The many secondary phenomena which occur during the machining process such as micro cracking, formation of uh, the heat affected zones uh, or maybe some striations because of reflow and recrystallization so on so forth <coughs> and we have to somehow be able to optimize the parametrics of processes so that these uh, secondary phenomena uh, may be minimized. Again the sources of heat as I just talked about could be many, uh, it could be EDM, uh, spark basically which is also known as electro spark machining or electro discharge machining. Uh, it could be a plasma beam commonly known as plasma beam machining, it could be photons commonly known as laser beam machining or electrons as an E beam machining or even ions as an ion beam machining so on so forth. Let us look at the, uh, the first of these processes which is the electro discharge machining process which was generated uh, more due to I think a war requirement in USSR in the year 1943. Uh, so, EDM is a process of uh, material removal by a controlled erosion and uh, which can be obtained through a series of electric sparks. The basic process is illustrated here right here and uh, you can see that there are two uh, electrodes here one formulates the tool another is the workpiece and uh, there is a dielectric medium which is otherwise an insulator which is flown between the tool and the workpiece in this particular region. So, this tank is actually full with that dielectric fluid in which all the setup is immersed. There is a servo control which is uh, used for giving a down feed to the tool. So, the tool can approach the workpiece surface and uh, you know there is a discharge that needs to occur between the surface. Uh, and uh, up to which we can say that machining is not taking place. But after the discharge has happened, there is obviously a local melt pool which is generated in the work material because of the high uh, pressure of the electrons which uh, strike the, the surface here right here as the spark is generated and uh, this melt pool can slowly be taken away by uh, the dielectric which is flowing around in the zone between the tool and the workpiece. So, dielectric otherwise is a fluid in, in nature. So, the discharge takes place between two points of the anode and cathode and there is an intense heat generated near the zone which melts and evaporates the material and uh, the material is generally cemented and evaporated due to a spark in the sparking zone. Okay. So, obviously for improving the effectiveness of the, uh, the workpiece and the tool 
uh, and the machining process, uh, you could submerge the whole thing in a highly insulating medium, so that the uh, spark power could be controlled. And uh, there are several such insulating mediums which are used, one of them is mineral oil, uh, another is hydrocarbons, there can be EDM oil, uh, so on so forth. So, uh, the experiments indicate that in case both the electrodes are of the same material, there is prominently more erosion of the electrode connected to the positive terminal. And therefore, normally the tool is made in this case the positive electrode. There is a reason for this to happen which I will explain in the following slides. So, let us now uh, look at why the spark should be generated and how it should be generated and what is the physics behind the generation of the, the spark process. So, basically if we make uh, the workpiece, the anode and the tool, the cathode, uh, there is going to be a discharge primarily composed of electrons which reaches uh, the anode, the anode being positively charged. And uh, if the discharge is made up of electrons, the, uh, the question that we should really ask is that what is the number of ions uh, reaching the uh, cathode versus what is the number of electrons which reaches the anode. How are ions formulated? That as soon as the spark is generated in the medium, which is because you know the medium has achieved its breakdown voltage or breakdown electric field, which is a function of two things. One is uh, applied voltage, and another is the distance between the two electrodes. So obviously, uh, electric field is the uh, the voltage per unit distance. So if the distance is small and it becomes smaller and smaller, uh, the electric field increases to a level where the medium breaks down and the spark gets emanated. So when the spark gets formulated, obviously there are high velocity electrons and uh, just in front of uh, the electrons there is the dielectric medium which can be easily ionized. So there are some secondary electrons and ions which are generated the moment this primary ions are sent in as a spark from one of the electrons, the cathode. So the ions would move towards the cathode, they are positively charged and the electrons would move towards the anode and obviously the electron density is much much higher in comparison to the ion density and obviously also the electrons move because of their lower mass at higher velocity. So, the amount of momentum delivery if we look at of the electrons vis a vis the, uh, the ions, the electrons would have uh, overall much more momentum transfer uh, in comparison to the ions. And one of the reasons why the uh, as I was just mentioning in the last slide, if the tool and workpiece are made of the same material, the anode has more depletion is mainly because the anode is primarily hit with the electrons and the electrons have high momentum and high momentum transfer. So, if uh, this principle can be deployed to a pair of work pieces where uh, the work piece or pair of materials where the work piece is made the anode, obviously the same effects would be captured and the electron would be able to uh, generate more damage on the surface rather than ion generating damage on the other surface. So therefore normally in all the cases the work piece is made the anode and any other material which is made the tool is made the cathode and the cathode does not uh, have although it gets worn down with time, but it may not be worn down that significantly as the workpiece uh, does and therefore, uh, you know you can say that the tool is machining uh, the, the workpiece because there is a relatively larger amount of debris coming out of uh, the anode than the cathode. So, obviously in an EDM process the electrons emanating from the cathode would first strike the neutral molecules of the electrolyte. Uh, tool is normally made the cathode and uh, the workpiece is made the anode. One of the reasons why uh, this is so is because uh, you know uh, when we talk about uh, the whole EDM process, it is about how the spark is generated. So, there is a cathode, there is an anode and there is some kind of a dielectric medium in between which is otherwise insulating in nature and then you are reducing the distance between the cathode and the anode. So, there is a possibility that the electric field between the anode and cathode may exceed the breakdown electric field which is needed for the, the dielectric to break down fully and uh, that is the point of time where you can have a discharge. Okay. So, uh, there is a voltage which is applied, a voltage signal which is apply, applied across the cathode and anode and there is a, a reduction in the uh, inter electrode distance. Uh, so, the electric field goes up as a function of that uh, you know lesser and lesser or lower and lower distance uh, between the electrodes and it hits upon a point where there is a breakdown. The moment there is a breakdown there is a release of electrons from the cathode 
uh, remember the tool is made the cathode in this case and these electrons which are released from the cathode they would actually come into the dielectric medium and start breaking down the dielectric fluid into ions and electrons. So, there is some kind of a ionization process that is happening uh, to the column which is trapped between the anode and cathode in this case and there are positive ions which are created there are also some secondary electrons which are created because of this, uh, this discharge. So, it is similar to what may happen uh, in case of welding, but that happens with air in between and obviously that happens for a longer amount of time here it is only a slow release or a one, one step release. So, the charge can get transferred completely at one go at short span of time. So, here the process is related to sparking okay, as opposed to uh, maybe welding processes which I had taught earlier in great details in manufacturing process technology 1, where it was for a longer time that the, uh, the, the spark was being formulated and we call such sparks actually arcs not sparks. Okay. So, here in this case it is a very short time discharge that we are talking about and that discharge once uh, uh, sort of generated from uh, the tool actually creates ionization and more secondary electrons. So, obviously, the electrons now would start going towards the anode, uh, the ions that are formulated in the columns would approach the cathode and if you look at the numbers of the electrons vis a vis number of ions, the electrons are much more or much more outnumbered in comparison to the ions. Number 2 because they are lighter in weight, they can be moved at a higher velocity and overall their impact momentum or the momentum that it delivers uh, because of the local electron pressure near the surface of the of the anode is much higher. And uh, because of such high momentum transfer, uh, there is a possibility that the anode uh, has more amount of uh, dip, uh, you know thermal energy and uh, more amount of melting and vaporization in comparison to the tool where maybe the ions are fewer and also although their mass is heavy, the velocities may not be that high and uh, therefore, uh, they may not overall in terms of numbers times of mass velocity product uh, may be able to uh, apply sufficient amount of momentum transfer for a, a huge removal of the uh, tool material through melting vaporization processes. So, overall uh, it is seen that if uh, in cases the materials are similar at both the anodes and cathodes, the anode would deplete uh, faster in comparison to, to the cathode and in fact, in all other EDM processes if the tool material is changed as well. So, in principle that is the reason why the, the configuration of the EDM tool is with workpiece at the anode side. So, well, let us just summarize. So, in this uh, for this reason the workpiece is generally made the anode. In EDM process electrons emanating from the cathodes first strike the neutral molecules of the dielectric and this undergo dissociation using producing cations and more electrons. These are secondary electrons just as I was talking about. The electrons are accelerated due to the electric field. Uh, they are ultimately used for dislodging other electrons and ions and uh, there is a suitable gap better known as a spark gap which is maintained between the tool and workpiece surfaces and sparks are made to discharge at very high frequency with suitable source. I will just tell you a little bit about the positioning of the spark and the way that the spark goes around the whole surface depending on what really is the inter electrode distance uh, as a function of the overall surface waveness and roughness of the electrodes. So, since the spark occurs at a spot where the tool and the workpiece surface are the closest and since the spot changes after each spark, uh, the sparks travel all over the surface and this results in a uniform material removal uh, all over the surface and finally, the workpiece confirms exactly to the tool surface. And thus, the tool produces the required impression on the workpiece. So, there are certain important aspects uh, in order to maintain uh, the predetermined spark gap because obviously, you have to go for certain distances where the V by D should produce an electric field which is greater than the breakdown field E breakdown okay, of the medium and generally it is preferred to have a servo control uh, in order to maintain that gap. The gap is sensed through an average voltage across it and then it is compared to a preset value and then there is a control based on a servo motor which would actually initiate the linear feed of the tool with respect to the workpiece. So, that the voltage changes to the predetermined value or the, or the preset value. So, there can be many other controls like a solenoid control is also possible for maintaining the gap uh, voltage 
and uh, some parametrics associated with this process is that the spark frequency is normally in the range of about uh, 200 to 50,000 hertz. That means so many sparks per cycle per second and uh, the spark gap uh, which is maintained is almost around 0 0.025 to 0 0.05 millimeters. Okay. So, it is basically 50 to 2.5 microns. The peak voltage across a gap is kept almost in the range of about 30 to 250 volts. So, you can understand what is the kind of electric field that is needed. Let us say 250 volts by uh, 0 0.025 uh, millimeters. Okay. So, that makes it about 10 to the power of 4 volts per meter or about close to 10 kV per meter. So, it is a pretty high field that we are talking about. An approximate estimate of the material removal, material uh, removal rates up to about 300 cube, cubic millimeter per minute can be obtained and the specific energy or power, specific power that is needed is about 10 watts per unit of material removed in mm cube per minute. So, the efficiency of performance increases uh, by many factors. One of them obviously is by changing the nature of the dielectric, another is by force circulation. So, the idea is that uh, the dielectric is also able to uh, generate uh, through the diffusion process a medium where the, the melt which is there uh, locally available at the anode after the sparking process has happened, after one such sparking process has to diffuse in. So, if uh, there is a circulation overall and if there is an increase in the flow velocity, this diffusive process will take away or carry more material. Okay? And so, therefore, uh, you would have lesser relaxation time uh, between the sparks because obviously, the ion column once created has to be uh, completely eliminated before another ion column can be set uh, and so, therefore, set in. And so, therefore, the frequency of the sparking process also would depend on how soon you are able to get rid of the debris for going up to the next cycle. So, the most commonly used dielectric fluid is kerosene and, uh, and the most commonly used tools are brass and copper alloys made up of brass and copper alloys. This shows a sort of a schematic uh, of how you know you could control the uh, through a servo the or a solenoid the inter electrode gap. So, there is a gap sensing capacitor here, gap voltage sensing capacitor here and there is also a solenoid where you know it controls this gap through a relative uh, difference between a um, reference voltage okay, and this gap voltage through a variable resistor. And in order to control the upward motion of the tool, supposing it has overdone and the voltage has shot up the preset value, there is always a counterweight which can be used to pull this back. So, the solenoid force and the force of tension uh, and you know are, are acting in opposite directions to each other and at equilibrium obviously, the solenoid force is same as the tension force and if the solenoid force which is also a function of this difference between the preset and the gap voltage uh, decreases, then the tension would be more dominant and the tool would go backwards. Similarly, if the uh, solenoid force is more than the tool force, it would go forward or the tool would feed forward into the workpiece. So, that is how you can operate uh, such, such a tool. Let us uh, look uh, at a little bit into the mechanics, uh, the basic mechanics of the EDM process. So, uh, here the idea is that there is a highly rough surface and of the tool in the workpiece and there are varying inter electrode gaps as you can see, there can be a peak to peak or a valley to valley. And so, the field at different places within the tool surface also is different. And so, we are actually looking forward to a distance which is actually the least distance, okay, maybe a peak to a peak facing each other where the field would be higher for a potential location of the spark. So, we will try to continue this in the next module. I am closing this in the interest of time and I would try to uh, talk about the basic mechanics, a little bit of how to estimate the material removal rate, etcetera of the spark machining process in the next lecture module. Up till then, goodbye and see you all. Thank you.